Yeah, okay. Yes, everybody here is supposed to be here? Yeah, okay. All right, in accordance with the Open, Public's Me Open Public Meetings Act, notice of this meeting has been provided by filing a copy thereof with the municipal clerk on January 3rd, 2012. Faxing a copy thereof with the municipal clerk on January 3rd, 2012. Oh, I'm sorry, faxing a copy thereof to the Home News Tribune, the Star Ledger, the Mirror, and the Monitor on January 4th, 2012 at 3.47 p.m. and posting a copy thereof on the bulletin board on the main floor of Borough Hall. 221 South Fifth Avenue, Highland Park, New Jersey, on January 4th, 2012, at 4 p.m. Fire exits are to my right and my left, which is your left and right, respectively. I would remind everybody in the audience, as well as here on the dais, to please speak into your microphones, and assistive listening devices are available. Eileen Hutchinson, would you please lead us in the pledge? Can you call the roll, please? Mayor Minkoff? Here. Councilwoman Bill Mittler? Here. Councilman Erickson? Here. Councilwoman Foster Dublin? Here. Councilman Millay? Here. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Here. Board Attorney? Here. Board Administrator? Here. Okay. Uh, is Polinaris here? No, no Main Street Minute. We have no Main Street Minute tonight. The mayor is always the last to find out. Didn't get a chance to tell you. Okay. <laughs> The mayor's still the last to find it. It's okay. All right, council reports for this evening. Uh, why don't we start with council member Foster Double? A uh, couple of things. Um, we have an OWL project that we have been working on. The Arts Commission and the Highland Park Arts Conservative have a project called OWLs on the Avenue that they're working on. And if you go by Main Street Highland Park, you'll see the owls displayed on 215 Ramton Avenue. They're really beautiful owls. There's an owl that has a rocket ship, one that looks like Elvis, and, and it's there. there's a pirate owl and everything else like that. So if you have a moment, please stop in at Main Street Highland Park and take a look at the beautiful owl, owls display. These owls will be, um, they're temporarily housed in Main Street Highland Park, but they're going to be coming in with the lovely street furniture that we have. So inside the living rooms of the streetscape, there'll be beautiful owls to sit, the wise owl of Highland Park. And the whole idea from the Arts Conservative came from, because Fifth Avenue um, is the avenue of the owls of high school. So that's just filling in on that idea, and they created this really, really beautiful project which will be placed along various avenues in Highland Park, starting from, I think, from 2nd Avenue up to 5th Avenue. There'll, there'll be owl, owls on the app, and also there'll be some at our municipal building here and over at the Senior Center. So it's, it's a wonderful project that they've worked on. A lot of time, a lot of energy went into this, and they are, there will be a press release announcing when the official grand opening of the owls or the official placement of the owls will be done. So that's on the owl project. Um, also, a um, couple of, last week we had, um, well it's not last, yeah, it's last week, we had our senior prom. And it was a wonderful, wonderful event. It was so great that this is the first time we've received a letter saying how wonderful the prom was and how much um, everyone enjoyed it. And for those of you who don't know, the senior prom is, um, it's for the seniors of Highland Park. So at the senior center, um, they, they've done on their best and they come out and they take a stroll down memory lane and music from, I would say, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s are played, and it's a wonderful time. Um, our police department comes out, and they, uh, they're all dressed up, and they dance with these ladies, and 
And they, everyone has a really, really good time. And for those of you who don't come, you should try to make it. It's always the second or third week in June that we have the senior prom, and it's wonderful. And I just want to thank the people that took time out to write us a note to say thank you um, that we still have this event going on in Highland Park. There is one more that's it's going to be it's on our agenda for tonight, and it's called Pinwheel for Peace. And Pinwheel for Peace, um, it's basically, um, we, the, the idea behind Pinwheel for Peace is to have one day when there is no wars that will be fought in the entire world. One day when we all can get along. And this project was brought to me by a teacher over at the school, at Bible School, and her idea is to have Highland Park be involved with Pinwheel for Peace and to have a huge pinwheel downtown Highland Park and everyone can write their wish for what it would be to be a peaceful world or what their wish would be to have peace. And um, hope, hopefully tonight this will be approved. And um, as we are going to be looking towards our September 11th memorial, this could be a project that we would write our best wishes for peace and have this huge pinwheel, and that would be a part of our September 11th memorial. Uh, that's my report. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Council Member Welkovitz. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a few items. Um, with regard to the food pantry, we are reintroducing the successful farmer's market voucher program to those that qualify. Applications are available at the Senior Youth Center to qualify for four free $5 vouchers to be used exclusively at the farmer's market. The vouchers will be distributed on July 10. Please sign up immediately if, if you qualify. Additionally, vendors from the farmer's market have generously agreed to donate leftovers to residents with food pantry IDs. This is available Friday afternoons at the municipal parking lot. And thanks to all of our dedicated food distribution volunteers. Um, with regard to the Housing Authority, since the departure by both the Executive Director and Managing Director of the Highland Park Housing Authority, we're very pleased to announce that Highland Park has entered into an interim agreement with the Woodbridge Housing Authority to take on the management of the HP Housing Authority, effective July 1. We're confident that Highland Park will benefit from the eagerness and depth of experience that the managers from Woodbridge are known. Plans are already in the works for upgrades to both the exterior and, and interior of the building with funds earmarked for immediate use. Uh, and with regard to the Board of Health, um, it's summertime, which means potentially mosquito control. The Borough Council and the Highland Park Board of Health want to assure that our residents are notified when mosquito spraying is to take place, although Highland Park rarely gets sprayed. But we have established procedures upon notification from the county approximately 24 hours in advance of any spraying. The borough will initiate a reverse 9-11 call to all residents, issue a Nixle message, post it on the website, and post on HPTV. For more information on mosquitoes, mosquito control, areas to be sprayed, including maps, please visit Middlesex County Mosquito Extermination Commission at www.co.middlesex.nj.us slash mosquito slash control dot ASP. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Council Member Malay. Thanks. I'm going to talk about something fun tonight for a change. Um, I got to go to the fireworks and was uh, helping out this, this Sunday and it was a, it was a wonderful time, if, if a little hot. Uh, we had plenty of uh, bands and plenty of food, and the fireworks were even, you know, longer and better than, than I remembered them. But it, it all happened because a lot of people uh, helped out, and it was co-sponsored by the uh, City of New Brunswick and Highland Park and the uh, Middlesex County Parks Department and Main Street Highland Park. And uh, a lot of people from the borough helped out, and since I'll probably forget the name, one of them, or two of them, I just said there was plenty of uh, people. We had our own booth with uh, popcorn and uh, snow, uh, ice, what is it, snow cones, snow I guess? Cones. Snow cones. I'm getting old. I can't even remember what I'm used to remembering. But, um, and there were lots of local bands, and uh, it, it was a wonderful time, especially after the sun started going down. So if... Uh, we're glad that in the last couple of years we've made the effort to get this going again because it really was a, a wonderful day. Councilman Erickson. No report. Council President Bill Milper. Okay, um, I have, do have something to report on, but before I do that, how many people here have email accounts? Can you show me? 
<laughs> okay. How many of the email account people have signed up for the borough's Nixle newsletter? Okay. Well, a lot of you haven't, and you're missing out on a great opportunity because as of July 2nd, everyone who is signed on to Nixel now gets our brand new e-newsletter. Um, I want to give a big thanks to uh, Matt Hirsch, who's chair of the borough's uh, Public Information Committee, and to Monica Jackson, who is our administrative secretary here. The two of them collaborated with Matt's committee, and um, our first e-newsletter made it out uh, on the airwaves, so to speak on July 2nd. Um, we have printed out copies for anyone who has not yet signed on to Nixel. It's also on our website. If, you, if you'd like to find it there, you can go to a link there. But what I would like to ask, um, uh, Borough Administrator, do, do we have a sign-up sheet for Nixel? There are forms at the clerk, on the clerk's counter for them to complete, and, or on the website, there's a, a place where you can complete something and, and right so it. so if you have an email account and you'd like to get our e-newsletters which will be going out every two weeks a uh, little pressure for Matt over there <laughs> um, please uh, before you leave tonight um, fill out a form at the borough clerk's desk um, counter over there or go on the website at some point this week and uh, get us your email address and we'll be happy to include you in the mailings thank you thank you Okay, so I have a few things that I would like to discuss. Um, the fireworks were terrific, so I'd like to thank everybody who helped orchestrate that. I'd like to thank our sponsors and underwriters. I'd like to thank our good neighbors from New Brunswick, and I'd like to thank everybody who I hope had the chance to go out to the park or be in New Brunswick on Sunday evening and participate. Oh. I apologize. Let me give special kudos to Council Member Foster Dublin for orchestrating that effort. So that's, uh, that is something that uh, we are pleased we've been able to restore to the borough, and it's, it's a special day for us to come together as a community. So let me mention a few different things that I would like to talk about. First, uh, if you look to my left, next in between Council Member Welkovitz and Council Member Foster Dublin, you will see an empty seat. Councilman Morris has resigned. And uh, regretfully, or regrettably, I guess I should say, we accept his resignation. We thank him for his loyal and diligent service for the past six plus years. I started with Councilman Morris on the Democratic Committee in 2000, so I've known him for quite some time. And um, he's always put his heart and soul into the borough. Uh, many of you may or may not realize that, I, if I remember correctly, he himself is a fifth generation Highland Park resident. So we are thankful for, for all that he's done. And a little later this evening in the executive session, we're going to interview uh, prospective council candidates. And then a little bit later after that, maybe a lot later, uh, we'll actually swear in a new council member or affirm in a new council member, as the case may be. So that's one item I wanted to talk about. Uh, in terms of a streetscape update on Raritan Avenue, uh, one of the things that I would say is that things appear to be moving along. So if you sense progress, that's because we're actually making some. The benches are in. The waste receptacles and recycling receptacles are in the sidewalks that had been uh, damaged or had in some way, shape, or form, uh, I don't want to use the word, been defective, but those are in the process of being relayed. If they weren't already, I believe all the sidewalks have been done and reconstructed. The rain gardens are in. The uh, tiles around the tree grates are going in for the streetscape design. The outdoor living rooms at the, uh, at the corners of uh, various intersections are in but for the fact that PSEG is now in the process of doing the lighting boxes so that these little uh, sort of coffee table lights, if you will, which will be a nice little amenity in those little seating areas at the corners, uh, will be in shortly. Uh, the planters have begun to come in and will continue to come in, and there will be another planting day in the near future so that those don't become garbage receptacles, but in fact will be receptacles for flowers and nice vegetation. So we're getting there. I don't want to say we're almost done, but we're a lot closer to done than we were before. Uh, as a complement to that, uh, the, the State Department of Transportation uh, last week on Thursday night and Friday night completed the paving 
of Raritan Avenue, second through Fifth Avenue, and they will be back sometime soon, they tell us, in order to complete the job, which means that they will stripe uh, and or actually mark out and properly stripe all of the parking and no parking areas along those streets as well. So we've done that. Uh, I would like to turn my attention now to uh, the sidewalk improvement program briefly and the sidewalk inspection. There's a letter over there which uh, some of you may have seen on the website and uh, others I've seen have emailed links to this. Uh, I'm just reading this because I would like this to be in the record and or for people who watch TV and don't realize that it's there uh, and would like a copy of this and hopefully to clarify some concerns that people have. So I, I think it pays to go through this a little bit. Uh, I will also preface my remarks by saying that I've asked both Scott Luthman, our Director of Code Enforcement, and Don Risch, our Director of Public Works, to join us this evening in case people have specific questions about uh, inspections, process, communication, et cetera, uh, coordination in terms of uh, root grinding, tree removal, et cetera, that at least this way uh, they can either answer you or begin to answer you and you can set the stage for direct follow-up to alleviate any frustration there as well. So let me indulge me while I read the first part of this. I'm not going to read the actual details of the program. We can answer questions about that, but there are some uh, perceptions and misperceptions that I would like to address here. So this letter says, Dear Resident, recently inspectors from the Borough of Highland Park at the direction of the governing body began a community-wide sidewalk inspection program. The program was in response to mounting complaints from residents who suggested that numerous sidewalks were in disrepair and potentially unsafe. Rather than, quote, target individual property owners, we chose to conduct a comprehensive inspection since it was clear that numerous sidewalks were in need of repair. To date, when this was published about a week or so ago, uh, this inspection had identified over 800 sidewalks in need of repair, including some council members' properties, which leaves us with the impression that our infrastructure upgrade was long overdue. Highland Park is a walking community, which means we must be sensitive to the safety needs of all our residents. I've served on the governing body for approximately 10 years, and candidly, sidewalk maintenance and related issues are one of the most challenging and controversial issues we're asked to address. During my tenure, I've had countless conversations with residents who have tripped on sidewalks, were afraid they would trip on sidewalks, refused to walk on sidewalks because they were broken or raised, or as the technical term is known, heaved, and who simply cannot understand how Island Park can describe itself as a walking and accessible town when we have such poorly maintained sidewalks. Many property owners have expressed frustra frustration, if not resentment, on the other hand, that the borough enforces its ordinance requiring property owners to maintain their sidewalks. Additionally, poor sidewalk conditions compound our safety problems. Pedestrians then choose to walk in the street, which creates yet another hazard. I'll digress for just a second. The number of times people have said to me that they feel safer risking getting hit by a car than tripping on a sidewalk is mind-boggling and uh, a little bit concerning. I would be the first to admit that the notices we initially issued were unclear. I cannot take back that initial correspondence. However, we have revised the notice to provide more detail about the inspection process as well as repair options, and I'm monitoring the timeliness of our follow-up to questions. Additionally, the reasons the borough utilizes a townwide town -wide sidewalk improvement program is not to enrich a contractor. It's for property owner convenience and affordability. The borough does not earn any money. We don't add administrative markup on the sidewalk improvement program. It wouldn't be legal or ethical to do so, and we're not seeking to profit in any way from these inspections. Moreover, there is a misperception that we've already selected a sidewalk repair contractor for the borough sidewalk improvement program, or that we have a preferred provider among those currently performing work individually for property owners. Neither of these are true. We are still accepting interest applications for our improvement program, so we have not even begun the process of selecting a contractor yet, and no contractor is favored by the borough. Property owners are free to choose any sidewalk repair contractor with whom they feel they can reach an agreement that meets their needs. To the extent that sidewalk repairs can be time consuming and possibly an unplanned and perhaps burdensome expense, I, as, as every member of the governing body, sympathetic. I also appreciate the concerns that trees may be compounding the problem. For the future, we can ask our Council Committee on Public Works to explore how to manage the balance of the benefits of our thousands of shade trees with their impact on sidewalk safety. Further, if our communications or inspection processes induced some confusion, hopefully our follow-up efforts to clarify will suffice. However, as currently written, our ordinance and accompanying code standard is clear. 
property owners in Highland Park have a responsibility to maintain their sidewalks so that they are safe and accessible. That's it. We have no other agenda at work here. Additionally, regarding the constitutionality of our sidewalk ordinance and our ability to enforce it, Highland Park's ordinance has actually been challenged in a case that was appealed to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Each court that heard the case and appeal upheld our ordinance. So please be assured that we are not violating any civil or constitutional right in mandating that property owners maintain their sidewalks as required by the ordinance. We recognize that the economy is not great and that this is a challenging time financially for many. And this is why we view the sidewalk improvement program as a convenient and affordable alternative to hiring a private contractor. It provides property owners with added time and flexibility to help cushion any potential meaning financial impact associated with these repairs. Participation in the borough's sidewalk improvement program is completely, completely optional. However, repairing a sidewalk violation is not optional. So once the town is notified of a hazard or once we identify it, it must be addressed. So any resident may engage, if they choose, a private contractor to ensure that their sidewalks are repaired. This process requires a zoning permit for which there is no charge so that we can inspect the repairs upon completion to ensure they comply with appropriate ordinances and ADA standards. Whether you decide to hire a contractor to help you with this through our program or on your own is up to you. All we ask is that within 60 days of receipt of a notice of an unsafe sidewalk condition, you either complete and file an interest form for potential participation in our sidewalk improvement program, which is available from the borough clerk's office, or on our website at hpborough.com, or file a zoning permit indicating your intent to make the repairs. Either approach is your conf confirmation that there is a potentially unsafe condition to be remediated. You are not required, however, to have the sidewalk fixed in that same 60-day period. The following two pages, which I'm not going to read, provide further details about the borough sidewalk improvement program. We appreciate your cooperation as we work together to, make, to continue making Highland Park a safe, accessible, and walkable community. If you have any additional questions or concerns, please contact Scott Luthman, Director of Code Enforcement, at 732-819-3795 or email him at sluthman at hpborough.com. You might imagine he's a little busy right now addressing questions related to the program, but we have asked him to maintain a 24 to 48 hour response time, especially now that he's back from vacation. If that does not happen, please contact our borough administrator. Borough Administrator Kovac is at the end of the dais at kkovac at hpborough.com uh, at 732-819-3780, and she will be glad to assist you. With best regards, Gary Minkoff, Mayor Six. Can somebody take the six out of there? There's a little typo at the end of that. Now I know why these meetings are so long. It's because I have so much to say. Okay, so I just wanted to share that. I, I assume that during public comment, there will be at least a couple of people that would like to share their concerns, frustration, whatever the case may be. So I want to make sure that, uh, that we uh, do that as well. I have some additional comments, but I forgot one thing. So uh, does the board administrator have a report? No report, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, Bill Attorney, do you have a report? No report, yet. Okay. Then I'm, I'm going to cover one other thing very briefly, uh, which is that, uh, as was announced this evening, we had a, uh, a meeting, an executive session, with uh, the special master in the Mount Royal uh, case uh, with Betsy McKenzie, and uh, both our uh, Mount Royal planner, Phil Caton, participated in the meeting, as did our Mount Royal Mit litigation counsel, Jeffrey Serenian. And uh, you may have noticed that this is not Borough Attorney Schmuel. Uh, so anyway, uh, what we did is we had a, a, a discussion with Betsy just about the various issues surrounding the case. Uh, we, we shared some of our concerns. She shared some of her concerns. And uh, what we've agreed to do is to follow up with her uh, after another meeting that the council will have in the next couple of weeks in order to be able to share additional information uh, with her, uh, potentially uh, with American Properties, the, uh, the plaintiff in the, uh, the outstanding suit. Everything appears to be on course in terms of settlement with the uh, River Road property. So uh, basically what we did is uh, we, we did not provide any specifics beyond what I just described because uh, A, we plan to see the new council leader, uh, member at some point later this evening, and B, because uh, we wanted her to digest what we talked about, uh, we wanted to digest what she talked about, et cetera, et cetera. So 
Uh, that's the latest in terms of what I'm able to share. And with that, without an attorney's report and an administrator's report, that was certainly a mayor's report, here's the way I'd like to handle public discussion. Uh, I, if I'm right, there are at least four categories of subjects that people would like to discuss tonight. So I'm assuming that these are the four. There's, bear with me for a second. I'm going to assume that there are people here that would like potentially to talk about the 7-Eleven application, that there are people here that would like to talk about Cleveland Avenue, that there are people that are here that would like to talk about sidewalks, and there are people that would like to talk about everything else. That's probably the best I can do in terms of categorizing things. So here's the way I, I propose that we do this, just in the interest of trying to manage this in some systematic and rational fashion. For those of you who have something other than the other three topics, i.e. the bucket, which is everything else, um, the first public comment what I'd like to do is ask people who have those issues, and then I will work in sequence so that whoever would like to be heard has the opportunity to be heard. Um, okay, so are you in the everything else category? Okay, would you please come up and share your name and address, and we'll go from there. Yes. Only you, Lou. <laughs> uh, Phyllis Goldstein, 30 South Adelaide. I did not have this topic until I found uh, this this evening, which I think is wonderful, the Highland Park News. But I think what is happening is a considerable percentage of the community is being disenfranchised by doing this on email. Not everybody has email, some are technologically talented, my suggestion is short and sweet. Make up copies, give them to the library, and that's probably one of the best places to disseminate this information. Thank you. Thank you. We might, we, we might just say, if I could, um, I believe if that hasn't already been points for print or plan to be the library, the Senior Rec Center, uh, here on the clerk's counter. Did we have any others? Senior Rec Center, Matt, uh, uh, where else did we have it? Senior Rec Center, oh, Housing Authority. Right, in the Housing Authority. So those are the four places that we plan to distribute printed copies of this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hirsch. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Matthew Hirsch, Fountain Avenue. Um, Thank you. I, I, I chair the Public Information Committee, and 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 we're uh, we're we're happy to have put out this inaugur this 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 first um, e-newsletter, and 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 we are very sensitive to the fact that not everybody is is seeing this, and in fact, it's 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 consumed uh, several of our of, of our meetings too. How to properly dis uh, distribute this 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 uh, uh, important resource? Uh, and make sure that the most people uh, can actually see it. So we we are also we're also going to work with we, we intend to work with local retailers too, and see if they'll and, and, and if they'll put it out as well as uh, as, as well as other locations of the mayor and council president Bro, Bro Miller mentioned. Um, I did also want to mention too that this is a it, it's it's at like like everything this is a, a work in progress, and um, uh, we do have Monica Jackson's uh, email address on. The newsletter. So any feedback we've already received some some very constructive feedback. So any feedback, uh, suggestions, tips, um, uh, 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 would be greatly appreciated because uh, you know we want to best reflect uh, uh, um, uh, everybody's interests uh, and, and and how they and how they want their municipal news to be to be delivered. Um, uh, it's it, it, it's twice a month, so we have a lot of, uh, we, we're, we're, we have the ability to provide uh, a good deal of information uh, without without uh, uh, losing uh, uh, items in the, you know, in the midst. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else in the other category? Yes, please. Uh, Miss 115 Alcazar Avenue. I have a, a concern about improving the uh, noise ordinance, um, I guess, in two, two areas. One, that, as I understand it, and I have copies, there are two, two, two ordinances. The one which I think is, um, addresses my concerns better is, is from part of the um, health department's uh, ordinance. But that seems to be unenforceable. I've uh, discussed this with the police department a few times. They generally 
um, don't seem to be aware of it all. And even when they, I've made them aware of it, they basically say that it's not enforced, to be enforced by them. So I think that should be looked into and, and resolved. Uh, having two different ordinances um, uh, might, might be a problem, uh, especially when one doesn't get enforced. And the, but then more generally, in neither of them is it clear that um, there's such a thing as uh, excessive noise during the daytime. And I think there is such a thing. Um, by excessive noise, I would say one should be able to get away from it in your own house if you shut the windows. And uh, that's not the case with some noises. Uh, maybe I could give two examples, uh, just something to, to think about uh, in, in, in maybe fixing this up. Um, one, uh, we, everyone in my neighborhood got a notice that somebody's going to have a live rock band this Saturday playing outside. Can't get away from that. They're loud. Um, even if you shut your windows, you're still going to be having to listen to, to that, even if you don't want to. I think that's wrong. Um, I know there's uh, a lot of people see it the other way, that uh, you can do what you want on your own property. Uh, my point is, yeah, but it's coming into my property. Um, another example of there's uh, right now no such thing as too loud a noise is that uh, a while ago the high school was announcing the moves in the football game. I live 10 blocks away from the high school. I could hear everything that was said. When I complained about it, I was told that nothing can be done uh, before 10 o'clock at night. Um, that's the kind of thing that I think is wrong. I think if it's something that loud, uh, there should be some way to, 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 uh, to eliminate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would just say I'm sympathetic to your comments, and I believe we are in the process of reviewing our noise ordinance uh, based on some other complaints that we had received. So that, that is a work in progress. Good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything else in the other category? No? Okay. Um, 711? No, I guessed wrong. Okay. Cleveland Avenue. Okay, that brings us to side. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Oh, yes? Oh, I'm Don't sorry. Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> well, if you want to come to these meetings, you have to pay attention. Before bedtime, because I put them to sleep. <laughs> yeah, the is wide awake then, so I don't know why it's a problem. <laughs> uh, no, it's time. Yeah, please make sure you tell us who you are, just for those who don't know you. My name is Lewis Pitchinson. I'm a retired le letter carrier, and I reside at 200 Jackson Avenue. Um, some of you knew know that by heart by now. At any rate, um, I had sidewalk comments, but I'll, I'll obviously hold those off. I'd like to say a couple things and ask a couple questions. Um, this past week, an organization that I'm associated with and, and, and part of the leadership of, which has been um, attempting to influence the developments that are occurring on Cleveland Avenue, put out a leaflet, and we got feedback from the community that indeed it was contained language that was perceived by some as to be inappropriate because they felt that our group was uh, was speaking out against renters. Um, we some some of us were aghast that because of all that our lives have have been working towards the needs of working people and people whose Mount Laurel protections were designed to help, um, it just hurt a lot. But as the hurt subsided, we realized that we certainly didn't want to create misper misperceptions about it and that any damage that we may have done, um, you know, was, was inappropriate, whether it was intended or not. So we chose to stop um, with that message and modified it as suggested. But we want to make it clear at this juncture that at no point are we... I'm, I'm sorry. Um, is that better, Ms. Baker? Okay, sorry. It, uh, forgive me. Um, it's a little... This issue really strikes 
me deeply. Um, uh, as I started to say, is that we want to make it clear, and Lou Pitchinson and Eileen Pitchinson want to make it clear, that at no point, never ever in our t uh, tenure with this organization in any way, or, or in any way in our lives, are we anti-renter. We have represented positions that favor, that may appear to be anti-rental, but we're not anti-rental either. But in this particular parcel of land, and that's the Illuminating Experiences parcel of land that is currently owned by Mr. Gross, we have represented that we would prefer that it be owner-occupied. Now, I don't want to go into that any further. The purpose of these few sentences was indeed to say, if indeed we have given the perception that we have stepped on folks' toes who are less advantaged than others, we beg your forgiveness. It is not our intent, never has been, and never will be. So we, we apologize for any, even though we feel that there were misperceptions, we apologize for any uh, feelings that were hurt. Um, for, I guess then, thank you for allowing me that time. Further, um, you mentioned indeed that um, the meeting with Ms. McKenzie this evening has resulted in you know, let me, let, me, let, me, let me digress for a moment. I finally got to see who Mr. Serenian looked like in the bathroom. You never knew it was him. <laughs> Too much information, Lou. Okay, Lou, this is a, this is a family show, so if you could please control <laughs> yourself. No, wait a minute. No, I didn't get to see that part. <laughs> At any rate, I didn't realize that such... This is going on YouTube. Could you go in? <laughs> as long as I get syndication. Listen, I, I didn't realize that this cult hero is a man of somewhat diminutive stature. But I, and I haven't yet, yet met him yet. That's so funny. I was going to ask you if he was taller than you imagined. <laughs> At any rate, God bless. Um, oops. Okay, you mentioned that in a meeting with Ms. McKenzie that the, 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 the governing body had agreed to meet within the next couple of weeks. Are you, does that mean that you're scheduling a special meeting? Uh, yeah, and we'll, we'll announce that formally over the next couple of days, we'll notice it. Um, that, that special meeting, though, I believe is going to be an executive session because we'll have the professionals there again. You know, since the since her attorney Schmier wasn't here, you know, we want to be able to brief him in and have some additional conversations. Yeah, um, is it still Judge Paley's intention to retire September 15th? As far as we know. Okay. Yeah, we Okay, thank you. Um, I'm sure someone, you mentioned River Road. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there's been rampant rumor in the neighborhood that there's talk that River Road is in some fashion involving Pulte Enterprises. Do you have, has, does the borough ha, uh, have any knowledge to that? I, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else does. A at one time, uh, Ephraim was the owner of that property and sold it, I believe. We're talking about the one over on. Yeah. You're talking no, about I'm the one where the Seneca is. Right. No, 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 no. That's we're talking about the new proposed I'm talking about the. I'm talking about the Honeywell properties. I mean, the only thing I could say is that I've heard those rumors, but I haven't. I haven't been able to what? confirm them, and I'm not. You know, I mean, just because people have said, you know, he might be talking to them or he might not, but I, I don't want to speculate on that. Okay. I mean, we have a sense that indeed. I mean, we had clear information that indeed there may be some sort of joint venture. Is that what it's called, Jim? Well, regardless of what happens, the agreement we have in place will be carried through to whatever developer finally puts hammer to nail. I mean, it's, it says it's going to be for sale. They will be for sale. It says it's going to be X densities. It's going to be X densities. There, it says it's going to be single family homes along the, you know, let's call it the perimeter. That's what it's going to be. So. I don't know what, you know, whatever he does, he does, but the contract is the contract. Thank you. That's Thank all I can say. Thank you. I, I'm most reassured by those comments. Thank you. Um, do you have any idea about time frame with rear parcel or illuminating experiences? I don't think we have anything necessarily new to report on that. I mean, you know, I mean, I guess one of the things that you know, we continued to talk about, which, you know, I'll, I'll seek the attorney's advice, but I think we can say this is, you know, again, we weren't given specific guidance that, you know, just because the judge is retiring that this has to be resolved by then. 
You know, I mean, if, if it were for some magical, wonderful set of reasons, that would be great. But, you know, we were, we were I don't, I think it's fair to say we weren't given guidance that, you know, uh, tonight even that said, you know, he's retiring on such and such a date, get your ducks in a row, get an offer together and go get it done by then. I mean, that, there was no, no, in, I don't think there was anything that could be characterized even close to that, right? No, that's correct, Mayor. I think the, the message is obviously the judge, like any other judge, whether he or she is retiring or not retiring, doesn't want things to languish, so you know, doesn't want to make sure that things are proceeding and moving forward and not stalled. But there was certainly no pressure tonight from the special master or anybody else. You know, no gun to the council's head. Just as long as progress is being made and things are being you know, moving along. Let's get to here because um, at at one of the sessions down in New Brunswick, the county court that some of us attended although we weren't allowed in it, we were told by some of the principals at the meeting that indeed uh, Judge Paley had expressed the desire to, to uh, move to conclusion prior to his retirement. So naturally that s s set us uh, aflame in a way, uh, you know, f with the suggestion that we have to, had to move forward in, in, in uh, how to say, with the speed of light when indeed we felt that a, a cautious approach would, would, be, would be more fruitful for all parties involved. Um, has, America, has American Properties come back? When, a, when have we last talked with American Properties? And, and B, um, have, have they lowered their density? Well, I can't speak to the second one, but I appreciate your try on that. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was a good effort. So that was, that was very, that was, you, you get 10 for style and 9.5 for degree of difficulty on that with the Olympics in mind. But um, so I, I can't speak to that. Um, what was the first question? <laughs> <laughs> Can't speak to that either, you rascal. I forget what the first one was. The first one was, indeed, when was the last time you, um, the, we have met, or, age, or our representatives have met with American Properties? Uh, recently? I mean, was it with a direct conversation? I mean, you know, I guess, I, I don't, I'm not sure how, I won't, how to best characterize that without sounding evasive, because I don't want to sound evasive. Yeah, I mean, attorneys and special master, and you know, it's not, there hasn't been a face to face. Meeting. It's again, it, it's difficult from the outside to, and well, there's a lot that you can't say. And, and Gary and I have talked about this, as well as with a no, number of the other governing body folks. It's very difficult for us because we are looking through an opaque or somewhat translucent. <laughs> A mirror as to as to what's going on because we don't have a seat at the table. So we're always begging. I took a shot, but can you? No, listen, and I, and I appreciate that. And um, you know, as as I've said before, and I think since you were you know you, you've been gracious enough to to be very honest about how everybody feels. I mean, I just want to reiterate what we've talked about in the context that the governing body is listening. We are paying attention. I realize, as I've said many times, you know, we're genuinely sympathetic to the frustration. Uh, you know, that everybody feels about not being able to have a, a deeper dialogue. So, you know, we're just trying to strike the right balance as we go through this, you know, while we retain all of our options on, on every one of the scenarios in terms of how to, how to best engage or not engage as we think that it serves the borough's best interest, uh, you know, whether it's directly, indirectly, you know, as, as managed by the judge. I, I'd just like to add that um, we, we believe, those of us in the, in, the, in the immediate neighborhood, for what it's worth, um, you know, we're constantly we can only be viewed as NIMBYs by folks, particularly folks who don't share our, our opinion. But we really believe that it's been through the, the last six months where the, the development that has been put in black and white for the front parcel is great for everybody in this town. All, all factors. Now, there's certain folks who aren't going to agree with that. But at the same time, we were faced with developments between 200 as much as 356 units. A lot of things could have been done, done better than what we got over there, but it was a negotiation process. And I think it was done in a less than adversarial fashion, which was to all of our credit. And we thank you for that. And we hope to continue in that fashion. But it's still, a, it's still difficult without a seat at the table. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Swain, 55 Cleveland Avenue. Um, <clears throat> Has the property, the Honeywell property received, or, or uh, Honeywell itself, received that letter? I can't remember exactly what it's called. Like a no further action letter, you mean? Yeah. From the DEP? Yeah. 
I'm, I'm not aware that they have. I mean, it, it, as it goes forward, nothing will get built without that. You know, it'll go through the same process of you know planning board approval that any other development. And since it's a development site, it will have to have that before it goes forward. So that letter hasn't been received yet. Uh, I, I don't know. They actually are in the modern. I think yeah, we'll have to find out. But it, it's it's not anything that we can negotiate away or that the developer can assist on. The the rules will be enforced. Right. So even let's say hypothetically they had their approvals. I don't know the next number of months. If it took another year for the DEP to issue that. That, you know, that's how long that would take. I mean, hypothetically, it's at the end of that process that the building could commence right. if they had all the approvals. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Comments? My name is Jane Ryan. I'm at 47 Cleveland Avenue. Um, I think a couple of comments to build on what Lou was saying and actually to reinforce what you were saying. One of the things that you said a number of times was in the best interest. And I think it's really important to confirm what is, um, to remember what is in the best interest of this town. And this isn't just for the Cleveland Avenue property. This is also 7-Eleven. Both of these um, properties are dealing with the same issue, which is big business coming in and trying to define for us, a small town, what's right for us and what they want is what's right for them and what's right for their pocketbook. And I do appreciate that you guys are trying um, and I appreciate that you will remember to do what's truly best for the town and to confirm that. So thank you. Thank you. Other comments, questions? A couple of months ago, some representatives of Amer American Properties gave a presentation here. And from what I remember of their presentation, um, they were going to build units that were for sale. Now, I, I haven't been keeping up with this maybe as much as some other people, but has that changed? How do we best answer that? Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. It, it, it was it a couple of months ago? Well, it was more than a couple months. It was about uh, whenever that hearing Does was. someone remember what the date was? It was last fall. Last fall. The only reason I know that is because I wasn't mayor yet. Just, just as a brief um, point on uh, land use, uh, as if a developer comes before a site in a, in a regular fashion, not, we as a borough cannot dictate whether it is for sale or rental. Now, the um, River Road properties were part of a contract, so that can be an element in the contract. So again, we're in negotiations, and so that can be an element in the contract, but it cannot be, uh, let's say, legally you know, enforced by any outside entity. Including so, the judge. So the yeah. judge, it, let's say that we, we hold each other into court, we sued each other, and we battled until we were bleeding. At the end of the day, if the judge agreed that rental units are what should go there, we have no ability, even on appeal, to mandate something different. Or, I mean, we can request. I wouldn't say that we wouldn't request. All I'm saying is that that's how far that control goes, is that the only way we were able to get that from the River Road arrangement is because it was a settlement and we did it, as Patrick said, by contract as opposed to through a lit litigious yeah. I, I a court-based process. I, I understand that. I, I was just... Um, well, the problem is that the judge has us kind of locked down in terms of what we're able to talk about right now vis-a-vis -vis the specifics of the, of, of the no negotiations. So that's why we're not answering it with much greater specificity. I, I was addressing the efficacy of the making a presentation about one thing and then... I'm sorry. Going ahead. Well, you asked about whether or not they were still up for sale, so, or if that was a... You no, know, no, my, so. my point was that they, they made a public presentation about the units being for sale. Mm -hmm. Apparently that has changed o over time. I, I don't remember being notified about it. Well, I guess the only thing I can say is that the judge decides what we're allowed to share with the public and what we're not allowed to share with the public. So to the extent that we can say that there have been some changes in that, we can say that. But they're not, as far as we know, unless the judge ordered, orders them the same way we're not allowed to talk about what specific numbers could be proposed for density or you know, what the specifics of a site plan could look like. 
So it's not a function of us notifying you because we don't want to. It's a function of the judge closes every conversation by saying, I am adjuring everybody. Is that a good legal word? I'm telling everybody in the strictest possible terms. You're not to discuss what we're talking about with anybody outside of my chambers. So yeah, that's the situation that we're in. That's fine. But maybe they should make a, a subsequent presentation that more reflects uh, what, what they're planning. Well, we, we could ask them to do that, but you know, they'd have to get the judge's permission. And if the judge said, OK, I think we'd be fine with that, wouldn't we? Sure. I don't see, I, I mean, is there, if they can make that initial presentation, which, which was incorrect, then they, they should be able to correct it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that there's a very specific set of legal reasons why they can't. We're engaged in negotiations in, a, in, a, in what is a very sensitive litigation right now, and the judge has said, not just to us, to them, I, I don't want you guys talking about what this looks like outside of my chambers. I want you talking to each other. And that's the, the way I want this to be. And, and I'm not saying that because I'm trying to be obstinate. That's part of what the frustration is that people are expressing here, and we're very sensitive to that. But I'm not going to find myself in contempt of court because I violated the judge's ruling. We'd be, I think we'd be happy to talk to the judge about, you know, is there more that we could share? Is there something that could be presented? I, th I think we certainly could ask that question. I just don't yeah, want to mislead you about what we could actually tell you. Just, just because of the misrepresentation, that's the that's right. uh, thing. If we come to an interim agreement, it will be made public. Right. But until that time, it will not be made public. Right. We can't. That's... And I'm, I'm not here to defend them, you know, so I'm not, I'm not going to speak to them, you know. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments about Cleveland Avenue? <coughs> Lois, would you please come up and tell us who you are and where you live? Hi there, Lois Lebing, North 2nd Avenue. Um, Cleveland Avenue, let's see, if I remember from that September meeting last year with the special master, we heard that on the Illuminating Experience property, American properties, that the low income, the properties range from, I don't remember the high end, but 269 for a 1-1, one, one, one bedroom, one bath. Mind you that- 269. For a one, no, 269 what? 000, 269,000. Oh, you mean like for a for sale unit? Or uh, for it was a one bedroom, one bath. I guess it must have been. It could okay. be rental. Okay. So it must have been the cost of 269. Okay. My notes. I uh, I'm, I'm just wrong. trying to make sure I understand. Thank, Thank you. you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it was 269. So I pointed out to the current owners, the longtime current owners, one of them, the B&Bs, that the Highlander has a one bedroom, one bath for $100,000 less not new, 150,000, and I'm sure we'll find that there are some higher and lower. North Brunswick this spring has a low income, must be an affordable unit, uh, you have to meet approval. Three bedrooms for $163,000. So when I pointed that out, one of the current owners, B, got very upset and indignant. And so I'm just wondering maybe if American Properties is the current owner B and B, or in some way that way. Um, I just figure what I'm going to do is the same as if 7-Eleven did get final approval back in May or June. Uh, that I'm going to boycott 7-Eleven, and I'm going to boycott Century 21, whether it's across New Jersey, out in Hawaii, in Highland Park. That's the way you want to get them listening to you. If someone has been talking, and now they put up, if the rumor is correct that the density keeps increasing, you say, fine, you are the owners, you have some control, our friends, our neighbors, B&B. &B. You can ask to have people, concerns heard. The density is horrific. You know, I'm not even going to repeat, the traffic, the schools, et cetera, is going to be tremendous. And I thought from my readings of low-income housing, um, the first and second rounds, that the special master, the judge, has to take into consideration not the town, not only the town, but the entire area. So that would be Brunswick, Piscataway, Edison, Kentuckian, and the employment opportunities. So by us losing illuminating experience as an industrial property, we've now lost the very jobs that a low-income person might be looking for to stay in this borough. And on, on, on the, keeping on that frame of mind, I wonder if, if anyone has pointed out how many properties are on the market in the borough currently, 
for a year ago when this started with the, pre, uh, the special master. Because when I walked behind me in Montgomery Apartments, a good one third of the electric meters outside are reading zeros. Now, I haven't been there, and it's, it's almost a year, well, half a year, not quite. So if you have, how many do we have? Huge apartment complexes, Adelaide Gardens, down in Fox Road. If you have a majority of, of vacancies in existing apartments, maybe that should just be part of your discussion with the judge. But anyhow, boycotting is very effective, folks. And I'll come back for sidewalks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I would just correct one thing that uh, Lois mentioned, uh, which is that uh, the approval that you're referring to for 711 was from the redevelopment agency. That's an active application before the planning board. So uh, there, there's been no determination one way or the other yet by the planning board. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, that. that's good. I was here in May, but I attended the you commission know? meeting, but they, it was advertised as final approval. So uh, it has not been approved? No, it's still an active application. Oh, and I think they've still got some hearings left and some, certainly some public discussion. Together. Either way, yes. approved or not, I'm boycotting. I, I hear you, and I wasn't, I'm not saying anything about that. I just wanted to make sure the public knew that there's still an opportunity to go out, and I would encourage those of you on either side of that discussion to make sure that the planning board hears your comments. Okay, um, any conversation? All right, so 711 we covered, Cleveland Avenue we covered. Um, we're also past our 15 minutes. What I'm going to propose without uh, creating an onerous burden for people is why don't we move through our uh, consent agenda and other items on the list and then I'm going to close this portion of public comment and this way we'll have some dedicated public comment specifically related to sidewalks. So, um, okay. So I need a motion to adopt the following items. Uh, 71200, uh, which is the resolution to approve bills list. 712, I'm sorry, 712200, resolution to approve bills list. 712201, resolution, resolution to amend annual salary resolution. 712202, resolution to authorize excavation and paving up Montgomery Street. 712203, resolution to approve taxi operator licenses. 712204, resolution to authorize credit for taxes, 28 North 8th Avenue. 712205, resolution to authorize submission of application to FEMA for fire prevention and safety grant. 712206, resolution to authorize submission of 2013 municipal alliance grant. 712207, resolution to award bid for asbestos removal, police and fire station renovation. 712208, professional services resolution CGP and H, administration of Highland Park Housing Rehab Program Phase 2. 712209, resolution to approve change order number one, Conquest Industries, Highland Park Street, Scape Route and Avenue. 712210, resolution to approve pay estimate number nine, Conquest Industries, Highland Park Street, Scape Route and Avenue. 712211, resolution to approve 2012 2013 ABC Club license. 712212, resolution to approve pinwheels for peace project. 712213, resolution to approve 2012 2013 plenary retail consumption license. 712214, resolution to approve pay estimate number two, Helios Construction Inc. Toilet addition at maintenance building. That, I presume, is the one at the high school on the uh, athletic field. Okay, can I have a motion to approve the items on the consent agenda? Motion to adopt. Second. Roll call. Councilwoman Bro Mittler. Um, may I ask a question? You might as well. Okay. Um, the resolution 712-213, I'm sorry we were tied up in uh, our earlier session. Could somebody talk to that first before we vote on that? It's renewing the liquor license. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any okay. any other questions or clarifications? Okay. Back to our regularly scheduled roll call vote. Councilwoman Bro Mittler. Yes. Councilman Erickson. Yes. Councilwoman Foster Dublin. Uh, yes, and I would like to have I would like to have all of Highland Park participate in the Pin Wheel for Peace project. It's really an important project, and it shows it would show us who we really are, who I know Highland Parkers are, that we are one that always strive to create peace and harmony in the world. It's going to be a great project, and I encourage everyone to stay tuned. I'll be sending out more information on it. And with that, yes. Councilman Malay. 
Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz. Yes. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to reopen public discussion, and I'd like to focus on comments and questions related to the sidewalk program. Again, I would mention that, uh, and I thank them for staying, we have the uh, Director of Public Works, Don Risch, here, and we have our <coughs> Director of Code Enforcement, mm -hmm. Scott Luthman, here, so they're also available to answer questions and address concerns. So, uh, sidewalk program? Uh, Karen Swain, 55 Cleveland Avenue. <clears throat> I already addressed a couple of these in an email to Scott Luthman and Don Risch and probably to everyone, <coughs> to the Environmental Commission, to the Shade Tree Commission. Um, regarding the letters that went out to homeowners, property owners, about their sidewalks, um, I, I found the wording to be not as clear as I would like it to be. And even in when, when you read the letter, Mayor, um, there was one thing that really concerned me uh, momentarily. I just want to make this comment. When, when we talk to homeowners about their going out and hiring a private contractor, if they want to, to do the sidewalk repairs, we should make sure that they know that if a tree, if a healthy tree is injured in the process, they are going to be held responsible for the tree. This is, I, my a personal feeling about this is that it should be immediately mentioned in the beginning of the letter, if there is a tree or tree roots involved, please see item 4A or however you want to word it. But as of now, I find that it's more confusing than anything. And I'm specifically concerned, obviously, with the trees of Highland Park. I, I appreciate that clarification. We certainly can update the letter. Um, Scott, when somebody comes for a, uh, a zoning permit, which is the way that they would, because again, under the sidewalk repair program or improvement program, we coordinate that effort. But if somebody does it independently, when they pick up a zoning permit or when they acquire a zoning permit, do we then advise them about that necessity if a tree is involved? Yes. Any, any step, the first question they're asked to bring the application. You should come up here so you can. Yeah. Why don't you borrow Kathy's mic? Yeah. Once the applicant comes in, they're told. <laughs> Speak into the microphone. I'm trying. Yeah. Okay. Can you turn up Scott's microphone? Okay. The part of Kathy will now be played by Scott Luther. So every applicant who comes in, um, Part of the application is they do have to mark down if a tree is part of the issue with the sidewalks. At that point, they are told prior to uh, doing any work on the sidewalk, they need to contact DPW to arrange for a root um, evaluation. Every contractor has been told that. Every resident has been told that. So even if a resident goes out on his or her own and hires, in other words, residents are not going to, homeowners or property owners, I should say, are not supposed to go out and just hire a contractor. They can't do that now. They can't just go out and hire a contractor and have the work. Because I've already seen contractors doing work on sidewalks. Yeah, I just said town. that any contractor who comes in also is told. Contractors have already been told, too, that if they don't call for the root grinding or the root evaluation, they will be issued a five hundred dollar fine if that tree dies. Not only that, we also stopped at least one contractor in town who was doing root grinding that they were not that were, they were not authorized to do. Um, that's correct, isn't it? Yeah. So that that's one thing. The other thing I'll mention just to this whole point about authorization, if I may, and it's not what you raised, but now's as good a time as any. Um, we've been made aware that there are contractors that have been out representing themselves as quote with the borough. We're handling the sidewalk repair program for the borough. You know, whatever euphemism or however, talk about spinning, right? However they're phrasing it, uh, we've had some very direct conversations with these contractors to let them know that we consider that. And I'll be very, very specific in my terminology. We've let, meant, yeah, let me back up and start that again. We've told them very clearly that we consider that an absolute misrepresentation of their relationship with us, which is non-existent. We find that unacceptable. We think it's misleading. 
and that either it will stop or they won't work in Highland Park because they're not going to get the permits to do the work. So, you know, as we become aware of those situations, uh, the same way that, you know, somebody had said, well, you know, you've got blue dots on this sidewalk and orange dots on that sidewalk. And, you know, when I walked around town, I thought, gee, when Scott comes back from vacation, I have to ask him what this color coding system is. <laughs> it turns out it's not our color coding system. When we mark out a sidewalk, that sort of inadvertently flags that for a contractor, scrupulous or otherwise, to say, oh, okay, this is one that I should approach, et cetera. So um, as, as we are discovering potential infractions, issues, et cetera, as we go through this, we are alerting contractors in a very direct, I mean, polite, but very direct and clear way that they either have to make clear that they're working independently and in what it is that they're supposed to do, or there could be consequences, and those consequences could include not working in the borough or stopping work until they comply. So, and, and just want to re just one thing that I think you, you were not clear about is that if you're doing it by yourself or through the borough's program, you must get a permit. There's no charge on the permit, and it's through that permitting process that you'll get all the information and all the necessary tree information. Or the so, contractor will. Yeah. Ah, uh, so really only the unscrupulous are going to go ahead and not bother getting the contract and not bother telling anyone that they're going to hire someone and there could be contractors coming in and doing the work without well, anyway. permits that that is a risk and we try okay. to you know and, and, we, and we certainly okay. try to be vigilant about identifying that so i i was i was a little bit naive about exactly how the process works so thank you no i appreciate you i appreciate you pointing it out to us thank you <coughs> yeah other questions or comments My name is Ellen Maughan. I live at 240 Wayne Street. And I have my concerns about the sidewalk um, issue are threefold. Um, I received a letter, like a lot of us did, from Mr. Luthman. And the letter uh, you know, said that our sidewalk was in violation. And it further said that, there, that no patching or leveling would be allowed. Um, I read the ordinance um, 941 plus the section 368 14 uh, at SEC. There's no clearly defined standard in there about what constitutes an unsafe sidewalk. Um, so we, my fam, I did contact Mr. Luthman about two weeks, two and a half, three weeks ago, and left a phone message asking for that information, but I, I did not get a response. Okay. I'll, I'll just lay them all out, and then you can respond. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, so my concern would be in the ordinance um, that there's some void for vagueness problem um, and about the enforceability of it. Um, second, um, when I read the ordinance, there was no prohibition against patching or leveling. And quite honestly, I'm at a real loss to understand how the, the, the town could enforce that sort of thing because where I live on Wayne Street between North 2nd and North 3rd, um, I took a quick survey on my way home on my bicycle from the train station this evening. There's 46 patches on the road there in one block. Um, it's been routinely done. I, I've lived there for 23 years. It's been patched since we moved there. Um, I've never had a problem with the patching. I think it's a reasonable and, and uh, economical and, and perfect response to the problem of some holes in the street. I don't think a street needs to be repaved every time there's a hole there. So I'm at a loss to understand both because there's no language in the, in the ordinance that, that, that prohibits patching, and also because of the borough's own conduct, why patching would not be an acceptable situation. I think that there could be a possibility of reasonable standards promulgated that would allow residents to patch their sidewalks economically and safely. And then the third concern that I have is, um, while we all want this to be a safe walking town, there's certainly um, aesthetic situation, uh, aesthetic concerns, environmental concerns. But my concern for the trees is, is as follows. I grew up in a small town in northern New Jersey called Woodridge, um, about the size of Highland Park. Uh, an old town, old trees, suffered from a similar product, a problem of sidewalks being uprooted. And the town at that time did come in and do some root grinding. Um, and within a couple of years of the root grinding, a, a storm blew through. I was still living there at the time. The tree was un so unstable that it did fall. And fortunately, it fell in the only safe place it could fall. It fell in our driveway. I was in my attic at the time. I heard the tree fall. It grazed the house, but fortunately didn't fall through the house. Otherwise, I guess um, uh, injury or death would have you know, resulted for me. 
um, but it fell in the driveway and it totaled two cars. Um, I, I would be concerned if we're, I know that the, the tree situation is part of the borough's application um, and I'd be really concerned with messing with the roots of our old trees. I have a really old oak tree in front of my house. Um, I, don't under, I, I don't see a huge uprooting problem in my, on my sidewalk, but I'd be really concerned about doing anything about that for safety reasons. Um, mine and those of safety of, of people walking by and my neighbors. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, certainly we appreciate the comments that you made and um, I think we should try to get some reasonable answers to those questions. And first of all, Can you um, I want to reassure you without uh, criticizing any employee or director of code enforcement that um, we're trying to adhere to a 24 <laughs> to 48 hour response time and none of us think that three weeks is good or acceptable. So. Um, Scott apologizes for that, but because he's here tonight, Scott, do you want to take a stab at the first couple and then we'll talk about root grinding? Yeah, the, the big issue with um, the patching is there's not a product out there that I know of that lasts. Everybody I talk to has, has said that, you know, oh, it lasts for a year. The problem is it only lasts for a year. And I, my question to them, well, if it pops in November and December, when can you repatch it? They're telling me, oh, in May. Well, that's six months that we, now we have the tripping hazard again. The problem, and that's what the problem is with the patching, that's why we don't allow that. The patching in the street, that's totally something different. Yeah, there's white patches and blacktop patches, and right. I, I might add a lot of them aren't level, and I have to go, I have to try to avoid them no, on my bicycle. Still, yeah, but that's why we don't allow the patching of the sidewalk. There's just, there's really not a product out there that lasts. Okay, we, I, I don't think we've tried it. Um, we might want to try that before we assert that, that that's, the, that that's going to happen. Well, certainly we could take a look at that, but I, th I think the overall thought is not just it, if it lasts or not, is that it's not considered as permanently stable. I think we certainly could relook at that aspect of the ordinance based on any materials knowledge that we could find that might suggest that technology exists today that would enable that. I think that's certainly something we could look into. That's certainly a reasonable request. Um, just in terms of the streets, I'd say a couple things. That's a different hazard because it's a vehicular hazard as opposed to a pedestrian hazard. Um, we've also tightened our ordinance there as well because, candidly, I've shared the concern that you have, which is that if a contractor who has a legal, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, easement, right of way, whatever you want to call it, a contractor that has the legal ability, whether it's public service, for example, or Verizon that's allowed to come in and dig up the street because they have a legal right to do so. Uh, and that could supersede our local ability. If they need to come in and lay cable, they're allowed to pull the permits, tell us if we're lucky that they're going to be doing work, and then they used to just be able to restore that street to whatever condition it happened. They, they wanted it to be, whatever the cheapest way of doing it was. What we've done is we've been able to tighten our ordinance to be able to say now that uh, they have to replace at least what was there, if not better. So, and in some cases now, like the work that's being done on North 5th, for example, uh, where PSEMB is replacing the gas line, uh, Scott Luthman and I talked today about the fact that uh, we want to see if we can get PSEMG to do a more substantive repaving than just the kind of uh, patching that's been done there. There are certain cases where they've replaced sidewalks as a result of this, which are not up to the standards that we would expect, and we're going to have them rip those sidewalks out and replace them or make them come up to standard. The other thing I would say is, Candidly, for a long period of time, for a variety of reasons, the patching that we did ourselves as a borough probably wasn't up to standard because we did cold, cold patching. So one of the things we purchased is what's known as a hot box. And it's not something that you use to heat food between innings at a ball game. Uh, what it does is it's basically a mini, you know, instead of getting all the paving infrastructure and equipment, it's effectively something which heats the patch to make it more permanent on the street and make it a, 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 a safer patch. So, uh, and, and the thing you didn't mention, by the way, is that um, we didn't just do this for everybody else. We're looking at and we're working with the library, the public schools, et cetera, because we also realized that there's public property where these are issues. So we didn't try to say, well, <laughs> let's target private property owners and ignore our own issues. You know, the issues that we've got, we're working on those as well. Uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to do this in a way that we hope is equitable. Uh, certainly when people bring reasonable concerns uh, or any concern for that matter, we want to hear it. We want to. This is a process of continuous improvement. So that speaks to, um, I think, your, the first two issues, root grinding. Donald, do you want to speak a little to that? As far as root grinding goes, we speaking to the mic, please. As far as root grinding goes, we have a contractor that comes out, does an evaluation on the roots, 
and he's a certified arborist. He takes very good care of our trees, and it's in his decision of what can be done if the roots can be ground, or if the tree has to be removed, or if the sidewalk can be swung around it. Meandered. When we talk to, when we have some, go out to look at someone's tree, we also, we, we met with the Shade Tree Commission with this gentleman that we hire, and we all discussed that we're going to first try to find other ways. For example, maybe having the sidewalk go around the root area. Um, something we can do to try to save the tree, but we have a tree expert to try to prevent exactly what you're saying, that the, we don't want roots ground down and then the tree becomes unstable. And that's what he's there for, to tell us you can't grind down the roots because then the tree will become unstable. Therefore, let's try doing or going around the roots or other ways to do it besides taking down the tree. We try, that's our last resort, but we don't want to leave a tree unstable. Right, and I think the other thing I would say is that, again, you know, to your qu comment about leveling agents and materials, I assume, I hope in my lifetime, if not much sooner than that, uh, that there will be, uh, I mean, I think they exist in some communities now. There are alternative materials for sidewalks that don't necessarily always involve concrete. You know, some of those are experimental, some are a little bit more advanced than others. You know, we've looked at those for potential replacements for the borough in certain instances. They also have to meet ADA standards and other guidelines as well. Um, so uh, so that, that's something. Now, there was, uh, so I, I think, did, did we answer your question? No, actually not the first one about okay, the standard I, I, I was, of I was keeping, safety okay. in the I, I thought it was possibly that we didn't answer the second one. Okay. Can we get some uh, legal commentary on and or some building code commentary then on this issue about uh, the ordinance and or how it interacts with the design standard? Well, the, well, the design standard is, the design standard is set by the state. I mean, on, on the replacement of the sidewalk or the install of the sidewalk. That, that, that is a state reg how we do that. Okay, yeah, that doesn't answer the question that the language of the, the ordinance itself doesn't um, indicate clearly what's a safe sidewalk and what's an unsafe sidewalk. It, that's, and that's not atypical. And the ordinance itself... Can you, can you speak into the microphone, please? I'm sorry. Thank you, Trish. Yeah, so as the mayor indicated, the, the validity of the ordinance has already been upheld by the courts, and it's not... Is her mic on? Can we turn up the volume? People are having trouble hearing the attorney. Sorry. Not really. Let's see if we can turn it. Is the mic not on? They're all on? Is that better? <laughs> I don't think I can get much closer to it than this. Okay, that's good. In any event, the, or the ordinance has, has the, the validity has already been tested in court. It's been, it's been sustained, so there isn't a problem with the ordinance. A lot of times in terms of the safety it's an engineering question and i can't speak to it legally there isn't an absolute standard there are certain rules of thumb guidelines but if you're trying to determine if you're trying to address tripping hazards it's one of the things you go out and look at you go out and look at crumbling sidewalks deteriorated sidewalks i can't go through the whole list because i'm not an engineer and i'm not a public works director i leave that to the experts but the fact that there isn't a specific set of criteria set forth in the ordinance does not mean that the ordinance itself is invalid scott could you give us a representative list of some of those issues i mean it's like a half inch of heaved sidewalk or something yeah, right. what are some of these things well the way we handled it was we considered a half inch ra uh, a raised sidewalk as a tripping hazard we had strictly gone out at first, we went by the rule of the law, and we had some issues because we were writing cracks, um, and then we, we, sit, we, we pulled back from that. We're just strictly out there looking for the tripping hazards. That's all we're looking for. Okay. Yeah, I thank you for that information. I, I would still assert, having a little background in the law myself, that th this is not at all clear for a homeowner, and we would need more guidance to really understand why the sidewalks are unsafe. Um, and really, in order to really be able to, to remediate it. I um, think that's a very fair comment. And maybe that's something we can take a look at, is how we can build some more of the details. Because if you don't go to the code enforcement book, I can understand how you could say, well, if I just checked it on the website and I was looking for a, a did, recipe, yeah. is it where, yeah, did, where would yeah. I find that? So yeah. I, I think that's a very, no pun intended, constructive comment. And uh, that's something that we should take a look at. So I'm going to ask our Public Works Committee, you know, as, as they work through these other questions related to trees, et cetera, that we take a look at that, the issue of leveling agents, et cetera, with the attorney. Yeah, I would ask that we would re revisit that because actually when I 
I've surveyed the holes. The white um, patches actually have held up very well. Mm -hmm. um, and look, some of them look like they've been there for years. So I'm, I'm surprised to hear that there's with no existing leveling agents that we feel like would be effective. So um, I would hope that all, would all be considered uh, so that it would um, stop the running of the 60 days for some of us who are, are, are seeking you know, more information from the borough, um, or at this point challenging it, if well, you will. Well, um, well we, I appreciate we, that. Could I just say something? Appreciate if, more if time. I could. No, thank you. I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't, I shouldn't interrupt. I didn't mean to do that. But I, I wanted to reassure you that this, the 60 days is not for repairs. 60 days is either to get a zoning permit, which suggests that you would want to pursue the repair on your own, for which there's no charge, or simply indicate an interest which is totally retractable at some future point in the sidewalk improvement program. So if you fill out that application and down the road either uh, we agree that, yeah, it's okay the way it is, or that um, you get a price from the borough and you say, I can do it less expensively on my own, or I can do it quicker on my own, or whatever else, whatever else the case may be, you retain flexibility. So you're not, so the, the idea here is for somebody to acknowledge that at least on initial inspection, there's an issue that co co collaboratively or independently or whatever that needs to be addressed in terms of that sidewalk. And if it's through conversation and reinspection, that's one way. If it's through the improvement program, that's another. If it's through an independent contractor, through permitting and, and inspection, that's yet another. So if we, if we applied for a zoning permit, that would show that Sure. You're, you're you know, either or. Whichever is more comfortable, you know, you could do both and then you can do a comparison as the prices come in. All right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Other comments or questions about the sidewalk? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, Marilyn Blade to Reich, uh, 324 Lincoln Avenue. Um, my, my big concern is, of course, some of the trees have uplifted the uh, sidewalks. Um, we have some new trees around our property. The sidewalks were completely level back in 2007 when we got it done. 2012, they lifted up because the trees are growing. That's one thing. Number two is I have an issue with, I know we're all concerned about the trees, but there's so many diseased trees in this town. Limbs that are, look like they're gonna fall. Property owners that have trees close to the sidewalk, close to the street th that are of issue. I wanted to know what the Shade Tree Commission's doing, number one, about this, or the Public Works Department's doing to trim bad limbs or someone who is a professional and they come and they look at the tree. There are steps to take and believe me, <laughs> there are trees all over the borough that need work. We have grants for pruning every year. There's tree pruning that, that's going on all over the place. So please uh, just take those steps and we'll look at your trees. Yeah, I mean, there's, go ahead, please, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, please, go ahead. Um, Karen, if I could ask you to get that information to Matt Hirsch, who is um, sitting right over there, and perhaps in one of the upcoming newsletters, we can get that information out. I think that's an excellent suggestion, albeit shameless selfly promoting, but nonetheless, <laughs> I think that's really good. Um, thank you. Um, I haven't got a smile out of you. Uh, yeah, so we have what, like 3,000 plus, if I remember correctly, street trees. And about how many do we get to prune every year between what CMF does and what the borough's able to do with our own equipment? I couldn't give you, I couldn't give you. But it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively low percentage as a function of the total. And that keeps everybody very busy and well occupied and well funded. So whatever we would do, it's a fraction of what we need to do. Uh, and so we, we recognize that. And, um, you know, certainly we could look at a more comprehensive uh, approach, perhaps with um, a slightly different approach to communication now that we have all these wonderful tools in place. And um, we'll, we'll, I don't want to say we'll take that under advisement because that sounds dismissive, but it's a good suggestion. You have a follow-up? Yes. Okay. Um, one problem is I think probably some of the um, property owners are concerned. They know they have bad trees on their property. But the cost of cutting down a tree is, is astronomical for some, so they let these very hazardous trees stay there. I don't know what we can do about that. Um, as, a, as we're saying, the sidewalks, I don't know if there's a special program we can 
think about for homeowners to cut down trees, you know. Well, the private property thing, we'd have to have some conversation about. That are impacting. I, I, I hear you. That's, that, there's more complexity to that than we could get into right now. But there's, it's, it'd be worth considering. I'm not sure when we get into issues of private property how we could assist with that. We'd have to take a good look at that. Um, OK, other questions or comments about the sidewalk? Yes, Mrs. Bickhart. Mrs. Bickhart, 307 Magnolia. My sidewalk is repaired. I just had it done. Didn't wait for the bar to come. However, the hedges that are covering major portions of the sidewalk that I've given, reported on, on more than one occasion, that I can't walk by because I get scratched. Isn't that part of the safe walking? The fences that are exceeding the height. Kathy gave me, no, what's her name? I'm sorry, I apologize, I'm terrible with names. Gave me a copy of the ordinance on the heights of hedges and fences. They're not being enforced. It's, un it's, it's unsafe to walk. Mrs. Bickhart, I appreciate that, and I'm glad that you told us about it, and we can relook at that just by way of context. I would say, help me out with the count here. Did we inspect maybe 1,500 to 2,000 sidewalks in the borough in the past month or so, month and a half? Then you had to we walk. We gave out 1,200 yeah. violation notices. That does not include the sidewalks that were good. So my only point is that with several part-time inspectors and, and a couple of full-time people working on this, that's been a very extensive project, and it doesn't mean that what you said is less important. I understand, important. but you had to walk past the head. Okay, so all I'm saying is that if we need to make a second pass as part of this process, we can do it, and there are people who have recorded separate requests for inspection, and it's a fair point. But we decided to focus with some, on some of the most obvious tripping hazards first. We certainly, in a follow-up pass, can deal with issues related to hedges, fencing, et cetera. And that's not to say that none of those are being observed or being cited. So I think that you know we, we want to follow up on those. I think it's just been a function of you start someplace, and we've tried to do this in a systematic fashion, and we want to continue to do it in a systematic fashion. So I'm not suggesting that what you've said isn't important. We started in a place, and we're going to continue down a path, and um, we'll deal with these things. We just have to, <laughs> we're a little under-resourced on some of these things. If we had an army of inspectors, we could do it in a week, and we could get on to the next thing and do it more comprehensively. We elected to focus on this particular aspect of things, as, and as you can see, there are still many questions and concerns, and it takes time to follow up on these things. So, Well, I've waited, excuse me for interrupting, but I've waited for eight and a half years for some of these hedges to disappear. Okay. And they keep growing taller and taller. And you'll well, have to wait another seven and a half years? I don't think that you'll have to wait another seven and a half years. But six months ago, we said we were going to go out and inspect the sidewalks, and we did it within six months. So I, I, think, I think we'll get to it reasonably, well, in a reasonably good. timely fashion. Um, just as an aside, there's a tree that was planted against my request. And as a matter of fact, I didn't return when they sent out some years ago uh, they were going to plant trees on our properties. I specifically didn't want one. And after I came home from work one day and I found a tree there, I called up and said, please come and remove it. I don't want it. No, it's yours. You have to keep it. So if the people complain about the roots on that are going to raise your sidewalks afterwards. That's how it came up, comes about. Other questions or comments about the sidewalk program? Hi, it's Lou Pitchinson again, 200 Jackson Avenue. Um, I introduced myself before as a retired letter carrier. And um, as, my, as I spent the last 15 years of my career in Highland Park, I dare say that um, I know every, I've walked every sidewalk uh, in this town. Um, uh, on a few occasions. Um, also having served as a council person not too long ago, I understand the difficulty of public administration in very, very difficult times. Um, so I, I think, I, I don't want it to get lost in the sauce, as the cliche goes, that what you folks have done is highly commendable. And that is that you've chosen to take on a difficult uh, solution um, to a problem that's existed in this borough for years and years. Um, 
perhaps the worst we can we can think that I can think of is not even a, uh, but it is illustrative of the tree heaving problem is the catwalks that some of us know about, where where sidewalks are heaved perhaps eight ten inches. Um, that that's a bit dramatic, but there are areas in town that are heaved four four inches and. Uh, as a letter carrier walking down the street, as I was always did with the boss said, I had to read mail as I was walking. Joan, are you smiling, kid? <laughs> Joan's got a letter carrier, a, a former letter carrier in her family. Uh, we had to have eyes in our toes, uh, specifically. For those folks who have, who have uh, you know, parents of young kids, how many times have we seen our kids on trikes and bikes down the street only to see their bodies elevate to come, to come down God knows where? So. Uh, congratulations, good people. It's a tough, tough problem. Um, you guys have taken it on. This administration, this governing body has taken it on, and I thank you for it. The challenge exists, as my good neighbors have pointed out, to um, administer the prob problem in an even and fair fashion. And I should like to footnote my own personal experience in that our notice of, uh, of non-compliance, if you will, um, was preceded by a um, contractor who was happy to give us an est estimate before we knew we had the problem. <laughs> yes, and that contractor has been spoken with, by the way. Okay. And, and and I, I, I did say I want to fo footnote the process. Knowing, because I had a conversation with the mayor and I had read some of the stuff he was putting out, knowing of his concern that we address this problem squarely and immediately up front, I notified um, Gary. He spoke to it immediately. Um, I got feedback from Mr. Luthman. Thank you so much for your immediate addressing the issues. Now, some folks haven't had that experience, and that's always the challenge. But also, good people, we have the lowest staffing that we've e of, of municipal employees that we've ever had in this town. DPW is, is perhaps half the staffing, Don? Oh, well, <laughs> from, from when you started, Don, what was that, 40? It's, 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 when you start, it was 24 to 18, so that's clearly 25%. Um, um, we all remember times when, when the town perhaps um, was, was cared for a, a, in, in a different way, but that was, was, was better times for all of us. I think um, I'm encouraging you, as always at, at length, to take these problems, these tough problems, on squarely and, and react to that situation courageously as you have done here. It's easy for public administration to sit back and say, we don't have the money to do anything about that and hide from the problem. You guys aren't doing that, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Lois, I believe you had some comments and then this gentleman right after uh, Ms. Levin. Lois Leving, North 2nd Avenue. On the letter that you uh, sent out, Mr. Mayor, and read to the public and to the people at home, the fifth paragraph um, you have down, but no citation for Highland Park Sidewalk Ordinance has actually been challenged uh, all the way appealed up to the New Jersey Supreme Court. Would someone please give me the citation for that and the year and which street it was? I, I don't have that with me, so I can't. When, when will, that's pretty interesting. I'm, I'm surprised it wasn't included in the letter. This year should be shouting from the rooftops, if indeed Well, we, somebody challenged it up to the Supreme Court. Can you tell me what decade? Yeah, I think it was in the last couple of years, wasn't it? As, and, as I understand it, it was in the last couple of years. Okay, and what street? Well, I don't remember specifically, but or roughly, I, I, so well, well let, let me put it to you a different way. Do you have a recollection of specifically who was involved in this that you would like to share with us? I didn't go to the Supreme Court. If you're talking about me, I'm I got talking, a I'm not talking about you. I, we, we will get you the citation and we'll make it public. How's that? We'll put it on the website. So I think the salient point is. is that the any um, court that it has gone before has approved it. And none have uh, rejected it. Okay. If, if anyone reads the NJSA 40 colon 65-14, and I'd love to, I wish I was here earlier to ask someone to pull out the uh, statute. Is it here by any chance, 4065? Read the Green Book. Mm -hmm. No, not the, is that the Rules of Court? That's the statutes? Title 40 and 48. Could you read 4065? Not the huge paragraph, just the two case laws. Fillmore Corporation that says every 
um, something about every you know, sidewalk has to be repaired. And then right next to it is Davis from the Supreme Court of New Jersey, 1976, that says homeowners are exempt. Could you read that? This, it's no. like two sentences. No, because that's not in this book. I have the statute. I don't right. Have the okay. So there's the there's the green book it's right there in front of Ms. Mittler. What's the purpose? Because. Hot off the press from Middlesex County College, there is a residential exception. There is a residential exception. There is a residential exception. It's from 1976, 1990. That's how many years ago? Well, that's not it's what I'll It's in the current 2012-2013 update. And here's a news flash that was new to me after five years. Lois, it's not in the computers. Me. Excuse system. me. Excuse me. Our borough attorney advised us that our information is accurate. He checked on this. At the next council meeting, we will report on the details that you request. Okay, so let's please make a note that we'll have that information. Does anyone remember what part of town, north side, south side, and I was think, it a business? I think, I think it was on the north side. We will get you the details and we will have this discussion. Okay? Yes. Because yeah, so that would be August or is there no meeting in August? No, there's a meeting in August and we'll, we'll air it out then. First Tuesday in August? No, it's August 14th. It's August 14th. Feel free to come back and join us, and we'll have this oh. conversation. Thank you. May I, may I mention that years ago, Helmetta and Jamesburg both replaced their own residential sidewalks because it falls under the ADA. OK, so here's a question on sidewalks, but slightly different than case law that should have been noted in your letter. If this is indeed private property, and anyone with a current um, side, uh, land survey should look and see your si those sidewalks in front of your house and alongside of your house are not on your property. But so if, if it was on your property, can't the sidewalk be removed and someone put grass in grass? I, I'm not, P.S., I'm an advocate for people with disabilities. I write under equal access and I'm a member of Team Access out of Edison. So is that not possible that if it's indeed private property? I don't believe we consider that private property, do we? I think it's in your letter. A few times your letter mentions As I property. understand that the sidewalk ordinance says that we don't require you to install a sidewalk, but if you install a sidewalk, the borough requires you to maintain it, and that and that, that is the ordinance that has been upheld repeatedly on, I shouldn't say repeatedly, has been upheld on court challenge. And especially so, to the Supreme Court. So therefore, so therefore, well, if I turn out to be inaccurate on that, I will be the first to stand corrected. Anybody that knows me say, knows that if I made a mistake, I will be the first to own up to it. So is the goal to say to me that I made a mistake, or is the goal to suggest that people should not be repairing their sidewalks if they're dangerous? No. I want what is the goal? I this? want the goal to have gone through up to the Supreme Court, and I simply want the citation. That, that's wonderful. And I said to you that on yes, August 14th, we'll give you that information, and if it's inaccurate, we'll correct it then. I have hot off the press the exemption for residential, if anyone wants it. As long as it's owner-occupied, you can't be living in Florida and renting it out, then it's co considered commercial. But the, it stands today in the 2012-2013 statutes that cannot be found. The up pocket part in the back, the update, is not on LexisNexis, is not in New Jersey courts. It cannot be found on the computer. And that's the problem. So it's you're, in and, the book. and you're going to share a copy of this with us? I have it. But if you get the book, I'll show you a 10-year-old, because you, you don't have the updates, because I was told years ago it's too costly. So the updates, I can understand that. But no matter what year your green book is, your state statute is, the copy at the clerk's office, unless it's right there, the old update pocket part will give you the same exemption, I'm guessing. But I'll give you one right now. Sure. Would you like to read it into the record? What? Rec How long is it? Why don't we incorporate it by reference? How's that? The mayor is giving his copy to the borough attorney. OK. I wrote cover on some of these. Cumulative annual pocket part is dated 2012 for use. Lois, I just said that it was incorporated by reference. Do you have other comments that you'd like to share with us? Because I know there are other people that have either similar concerns or other concerns. And the council has a lot of business to do after this meeting is over. So I'll be I want to make sure. I'll be back. Perfectly Thank fine. You. And we can discuss this at the August meeting. OK? Other com yes, uh, sir, you had some comments? Steve Euro, 41 Highland. Mm -hmm. um, 
sort of a new resident, although I've lived here seven years, three and a half in an apartment, and three and a half in a house. And it's no doubt the sidewalks are a problem. But I find it a little bit ironic that it seems excessive in some situations. I've walked down the street and seen, you know, a half inch is not much. And when you're outside, blocks are going to move. And to tear up a whole sidewalk that's just a half inch off that could be patched, perhaps, or even not needing patching, seems to me excessive. And of course, maybe I'm in the minority because I'm one of those houses who has that. You know, in the three and a half years I've had the house, the basement's flooded twice, the stairs to the front need work, the driveway needs work, the front yard is being infested with vines from underneath the grass. So the sidewalk to me was the best part of the house and that's where I got sighted. And especially I'm an environmentally oriented to dig up a perfectly good sidewalk block to put in another one where it seems to me, I'm not an expert, but things move around a little and a half inch seems like too tight a tolerance. I mean, we did pass our home inspection. I don't know why three inches is, is, in, my, is in my head. I don't know what it was back three, four years ago, what you know, the buyer or seller had to fix. But we qualified for that just three and a half years ago and now we're confronted with this added expense and frustration and on top of that, no one walks on our sidewalk. They walk out our driveway across the street because if they walk to our sidewalk, they end up with bushes and a, a path with glass on it. There's glass pieces on it, so no one really even walks on our sidewalk. So that's the added frustration. As I say, you know, no doubt we need some sidewalk repair, but I think it's just gone from zero to 180. And I think they're you know, writing up everyone in Highland Park is just not a good feeling. Well, we didn't, first of all, I appreciate your comments. We didn't write everybody up in Highland Park. That's the first thing. And I take what you say very seriously and I take what you say very literally. Second thing is, have you, I, used, I don't want to make any assumptions, have you pushed a baby carriage, a stroller, a wheelchair on those same sidewalks? Yes, I have to. Have, to you, have, you, have you seen somebody in a wheelchair nearly fly out of a, a wheelchair because they don't have a seat belt because of gaps or would have been identified as, quote, unsafe conditions? So here's the issue. We're going to go back and look at whoever is in the sidewalk improver, improvement program or who has signed up as an intent to participate in the program. We're going to go back and look at those sidewalks again. You're welcome to have us take a look and see if we misjudged in some way, shape, or form. But as was said earlier, there's a design standard that speaks to a half an inch. And while it may or may not seem like it's either arbitrary or whatever else, it's not arbitrary. That's the point at which we've identified that there's an actual tripping hazard there. This, this is a walking town. And while a half an inch doesn't seem like a big deal, if it was identified that that's really what the concern is, either because of gaps or whatever else the case might be, then there's a reason why we're recommending that that's being done. Now, in terms of the, the frustration and the economic expense, that's why we said that, and again, we're not pushing this. We're only emphasizing to people that if somebody has, feels forced or compelled to have to incur some large lump sum to get a sidewalk repaired according to what the ordinance says, then we've given the option of people participating in the sidewalk improvement program. And I think now is an appropriate time for me to say that when I talk to people in other towns and I tell them about our sidewalk improvement program, I didn't create this program. This was here long before I joined the council. People in other towns say, I wish that my town had a program like that where I could sign up and that after the engineers and all the inspections have been done, then the clock, quote unquote, starts taking on either a lump sum then after the last sidewalk is done, not when my sidewalk is done, or I can pay it out interest-free over a five-year period in equal installments. I mean, that's... You know, so we're trying to afford people the flexibility where we, where we certainly can. If people elect to do it sooner because they either think it's going to be cheaper or because they think it's going to be faster or better, you know, that's certainly their option. Uh, but what we're trying to do here, we didn't summons an entire town to be spiteful and we didn't summons an entire town. What we did is we went around and we, we made what we thought was a reasonable inspection of sidewalks. Could it be that in, quote, 1,200 approximate, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to use the word violations. Uh, observations of unsafe sidewalk conditions that either we missed a few or that there were some that need to be relooked at. It's certainly possible and I would allow for that possibility because I'm not familiar with your sidewalks. But in terms of trying to emphasize the importance of making the, the town that the town had uh, that uh, enough homeowners or enough property owners 
had allowed sidewalks to deteriorate, that we felt that this was the best way to address this as opposed to, as I said earlier, target people. That's really what the impetus was behind this. So, you know, what seems, you know, we could talk about what, you know, seems safe or what doesn't safe, but in terms of trying to uniformly apply a standard, the half inch was the number that we used based on a design standard from, where is that standard from, Scott? Is that the state building code? It's, that's from the state building code. So that, that, that's what we used. So, uh, so rather than, I don't even want to use the word arbitrary, but that's the, that's the guideline that we used, and that's the standard that we applied. And the state also requires that homeowners can't do their own repair, even if it's a minor patching repair. That's, well, that's another problem that I, I have with well, this, we, that well, we talked about forced to go out and hire experts to dig up the whole block because it's a half inch higher. And no, we talked, well, we talked about the issue with leveling agents earlier, right, or, or patching. So, you know, we said that that's something that we can take a look at. Okay. Uh, oh, but, but you can always do your own work as long as you get the permits. But I understood that you can't get the cement. If you do your own work, you're not capable of using the cement type that's required, 400 PSI or something. We had the code person come back out and look at it, and she goes, you did this work yourself? I go, yeah. I went patching. to the depot. Patching. I went to patching. I yeah, got that's, the patching that's, that, The problem is the patching. You, if you wanted to dig up a section of your sidewalk, hire somebody to deliver the concrete and trial it out yourself, you're perfectly, you know, as long as you go through the, you know, code, uh, through the, you know, the permit process, you could do that. I, I'm just saying it's an option. It, it's not a wonderful option. I'm just pointing out um, there's no restriction as long as, you know, you feel competent in doing that to repairing your own, you know, replacing, let's say, a section of sidewalk. But it's probably not cost effective, you know, considering I, your, the value of your time. I want to say I'm sympathetic to the frustration that you feel. I really am. There's, there's never a good time to do something like this. You know, I've heard comments about, not from you necessarily, about, the recession about, you know, just the, the different economic pressures that people are feeling, the other pressures that people, people are feeling, we get that. We really do. Uh, it may not seem like we do, but we do. And then you try to strike the balance about what would provide for a safer set of conditions in a walking town, okay? And so what effectively happens is then we have a series of standards that we use to define what we consider to be a safe sidewalk based on what the building codes are and, you know, while the ordinance maybe should be clarified in terms of being made more specific, and we're going to take a look at that, this is where we are right now. So I, I really am sympathetic to the frustration, but if an inspector went out there and said that they don't think your sidewalk is safe, they weren't targeting you. And if you think that that sidewalk is safe, you know, you, I don't know, if, if you called Scott, if Scott came back to visit, or if the other inspector came back, back to visit, did you meet with the inspector? The, yes, the other came back to visit. Okay. Said it's not, the cement you used isn't, isn't good enough. Okay, well, that's... So, you know, it's good enough. I don't think a reasonable person would have a problem. I think what Scott was saying is, well, what happens in the middle of the winter if it's going to break? Then we have a risk. But, you know, I think that's, again, going excessive. There's just so many other problems that... Well, we, well, we have to know, start someplace, and our ordinance is where we started. Right, but don't start at a half inch. It's excessive. That's, I, I don't want to repeat, so I thank you for your time. Yeah, before anybody else goes a second time, is there anybody else that would like to speak to this? Randy? Yes, and then this gentleman after, I'm sorry, is that okay? Yeah. Uh, Randy Solomon, 331 Felton Avenue. Um, one point I wanted to make is that uh, in, you know, I, I'm aware, and uh, John Erickson mentioned it to me at a Sustainable Hound Park meeting, that you're investigating the rubberized um, alternative pavers. And I really encourage you to, to look deeply at that. And maybe that's something that we at Sustainable Highland Park could look at again um, and do some research for you. Uh, it's build as a more sustainable option. And they're supposed to be longer lasting. And when they do get pushed up, they don't necessarily break. So you don't have to replace them. You can reset them. Um, but I want to know, is, is that something that's going to be considered by the borough's contractor? Um, Will that be will that be an option, and how how will we know that? Because I'm I'm at the point right now where I have to make a decision also whether to go with a private contractor or wait for the borough. Well, we haven't we haven't really gone down the road yet with the contractor because we're still finishing out the inspection process, and then we have to go back and get a clearer estimate so that, for example, we could say to you if you if you were potentially interested mm -hmm. in the program, here's what it would cost for the program because nobody right. nobody will be asked to participate definitively until they get a written estimate that says this is exactly what you can expect at the cost. 
So, um, so you have some time, and I guess if you had the information soon, we could ask the engineer as part of the, the specs to certainly to take a look at it to see if it would meet whatever spec. I mean, it, I think we could look at it for sure. Where we'd wind up on it, I don't know, but I think it's a conversation worth exploring. Yeah. I know in Rutherford they uh, changed the town's ordinance to specifically allow it after doing a, a pilot test on some municipal property, and uh, they, I walked on it. Checked it out. I thought it was pretty good. So that's one thing. So I'll I'll, I'll that probably would be helpful. Okay. Hatched in the past, and um, and they're starting to come up, and you know, and so this what this allows me is that I have a certain section that really needs to be replaced, and this allows me to get it done. It'll be done, and I'll pay it off over a time period. So I, I think. It, it is an imposition, but there are things out there that you can look at as opportunities. And this, I'm looking at an opportunity. This will be repaired. And so, you know, I, every three years, I won't be going out and futzing and making sure the weeds are out so it doesn't, you know. And then when, you know, when it comes time to, you know, perhaps sell in, you know, 10, 15 years, I'll have a, a decent sidewalk that I won't have to worry about. So I, I think you know, on, on the flip side, you can look at the sidewalk improvement program as something of an opportunity that you can take advantage of because, you know, let's say it's, uh, you know, between three and 400 a, a section at the most, you know, so if I have three sections, so, you know, it, it's, it's maybe 250 a year, which I can handle while at this point in time in the, you know, I might not be able to, you know, do the 1,200 right off the bat. So it's, it, it's, it's, it can be looked at as an opportunity as well. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to uh, close. Oh, I'm sorry. Jane, could you just come back up to the mic? I'm sorry. Okay. I'm going to make this the last comment, then we need to adjourn to our next executive session. Yes, please. Go ahead. Jane at 47 Cleveland, once again. Um, a question off topic. Is it possible for you to tell us who you're interviewing for the empty slot? For the empty council person slot, um, sure. I guess, yeah. Um, who has that list? The broker. You don't know. <laughs> oh no! Well, we we know. We know. Einstein once said, "I don't memorize anything. Trust I can look up." And I'm no Einstein. You can rest assured. Okay, uh, Matthew Hirsch, Gary Potts, and Robert Rosner. Those are the three people that are interviewing for the slot. Okay. Okay, so can I have, thank you all. Uh, I realize that sometimes the things that we say, we don't always agree. Uh, I do appreciate the sentiments that have been expressed. And uh, even if we didn't get to something that we said we will fix tonight, I wrote down your comments and we will distribute the responsibilities along the suggestions that you had. Please remember the wheels of government sometimes turn slower than we would all like. Okay, so with that said, can I have a motion to adjourn to executive? Motion to adjourn. Sick. Second. Okay, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you all, and have a good night. Enjoy your summer, and uh, for those of you that are back in August, we'll see you then. Okay, so, all right, so I'm reconvening this uh, regular session of the governing body. Do I need to reread the Open Public Meetings Act? Okay, so um, what I need is a motion to, um, Nominate or to appoint a new council person? Is that how? Oh, I'm sorry. You gave me the script. Yes, you did. And I'm sorry that. Oh, here we go. Oh, okay. I need a resolution to appoint a new council member. You can I have a motion to adopt or reject. I move to uh, appoint uh, Gary Potts council member. Can I have a second? A second. Okay. Second. Can I have a roll call? Okay. Councilwoman Bill Mittler? Yes. Councilman Erickson? Yes. Councilman Millay? Yes. Councilwoman Welkovitz? Yes. Okay, the oath of office will now be administered to the new council person by Mayor Minkoff. That's you, Gare. Right. We just dumped. I gotta stop. <laughs> See, I'm referring so to myself as Mayor Minkoff in third person because you're Gary and I'm Gary and it's just going to get very confusing right over there. <laughs> and he's Gary, right? Three Gary's in my room. I love that for a minute. Oh, there's Gary. Okay. 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 So, um, this is the Bible. Uh, and you, well, only one of the right hand. Okay. okay. 
Um, okay, so I state your name. I, Jerry Potts. Do solemnly swear or word firm. Do solemnly swear or word firm. Well, you want to swear or word firm? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, that I will faithfully, impartially, and justly. That I will faithfully, impartially, and justly, justly perform all the duties of the office of council person. Perform all the duties of the office of council person. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. I do further solemnly swear. I do fur further solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will prove bear, bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the governments established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. Congratulations. Short recess for cake. What? No cake. Mm, <laughs> <right. laughs> okay, so uh, that was the. Oh, sorry. Okay, that was the only order of business no. here. Oh, no. I'm sorry. What do we have to do? Oh, I. Okay. We have a resolution to amend resolution number 1-12-03 regarding standing committees. And can I have a motion to adopt or reject? So moved. Second. Roll call. Councilwoman Pearl Mittler? Yes. Councilman Erickson? Yes. Councilman Malay? Yes. Councilman Potts? Yes. <laughs> Councilwoman Wilkovitz? Yes. Okay, so according to the chart, which does not yet have, what? That's the yes. makeup now. Okay, I'll just read this so that people know how this shakes out. So the committee chairs now on the council will be Recreation and Arts, will be uh, council persons, uh, Councilperson Potts, uh, and assisting on that committee will be uh, Council President Bill Mittler and Council Member Foster Dublin. Economic Development and Planning will be Council President Burl Mittler, along with Council Members Malay and Welkovitz. Uh, in Finance uh, will be Council Member Erickson, along with Council Member Welkovitz and Council President Burl Mittler. Uh, Chairing Health and Human Services will be Council Member Welkovitz, Council Member Erickson, and Council Member Potts. Public safety will now be chaired by Council Person, I'm sorry, Council Member Foster Dublin, uh, with Council Persons Potts and Malay. And Public Works and Public Utilities will be now chaired by Council Person Malay, uh, and Council Members Foster Dublin, and Council Member Erickson. So that is our new reorganized alignment. Okay. All right. So. Um, we, I now need a motion to adjourn again to executive session uh, for an item related to potential litigation. So moved. Second. Okay, so uh, I think we're adjourned? Yeah. Okay. Where is the resolution yes. number? Oh, the resolution number four. Executive session. Executive session. What is the resolution number? 12 to 18. 12 to, I'm sorry, 12 to 18. Thank you.